Welcome to Access Control, a podcast providing practical security advice for startups, advice from people who've been there. Each episode, we'll interview a leader in their field and learn best practices and practical tips for securing your org. For today's episode, I'll be talking to Hissam Al-Hakimi. Hissam is a security compliance manager and has focused his career on security, privacy and compliance. Hissam has worked both in consulting firms and in-house. For today's episode, we'll keep things high level and get a perspective as a compliance practitioner, focusing on assurance, the advantages of FedRAMP, barriers, and the underlying standards and setting bodies requirements, such as NIST, CISA, and FISMA. Since this episode is a deep dive into compliance, I'll add a note that Hissam's opinions are that of a practitioner and do not reflect any or past employers. And with all policy and compliance advice, please consult with your in-house counsel before implementing any advice from our free podcast. Hassam, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Ben. Glad to be here. So to kick things off, can you explain what compliance is and why do companies need it? Sure. I I view security compliance when done right as kind of like a business enabler, right? So it's the undergoing of independent verifications of controls to achieve certifications or reports. And those are tangible outputs that are used to demonstrate to customers that a company is able to meet a certain bar, be it privacy, be it security, public and safety, whatever it might be, right? That's, that's kind of the end goal of compliance is to give uh, customers confidence in what you're providing. It also boils down to like building and maintaining trust, right? So there's, there's a cost attributed to compliance and like a strategic intention. So companies really need to invest. So an ability of a company to achieve and maintain compliance signals to customers commitment, right? Because there is repeated actions involved. There's honest communication and adequate disclosures that need to happen. It's not a one-time thing. And then just one of many duties to the community and stakeholders. Sometimes less talked about compliance protects companies from the fines now and litigations, which can lead to reputational damage and a lot of other things that might be detrimental to a company's growth. Yeah, and I think of the last, let's say, decade or so, we've seen a lot more that's been very specific to sort of startups and the internet industry as it sort of developed, you know, even going simple as GDPR or like European sort of regulations that you have to keep in compliance with. Whether it's privacy, uh, you know, user trust, health, you know, non-compliance is really not an option because this can result in significant fines, sanctions that, again, can be be very detrimental to the company's growth, reputational damage. And, and in some cases, we've seen it can even lead to a company's destruction, right? I mean, obviously, that's the extreme, but, but it's all possible. So there's a very real incentive for companies, uh, for companies to achieve assurance and, and take compliance seriously, as it's a kind of a byproduct of security, right? Yeah. So for today's episode, we'll deep dive into FedRAMP. Can you describe what this program is and why companies would go about getting certified? Sure. Yeah. So, so FedRAMP is a risk management program that was, that was brought about to promote the adoption of cloud technologies across the federal government. Um, and, and the way they, they plan to do that, and, and they are doing that, is providing kind of a standardized approach to the security, to the assessment process, and then to, to monitoring. A, a primary reason why a company would want to pursue FedRAMP would be because they want to do business with the government. So if they plan to store, process, or transmit federal data or metadata, um, achieving a FedRAMP authorization kind of grants them that authority to operate. And I think the one thing I've seen is lots of companies which started off as traditional SaaS companies have gone through the FedRAMP process to be able to sell their same tool to the government. And sometimes that tool might have some other tweaks or it could be slightly different to kind of obtain compliance. I think you bring up a good point because a company achieves a FedRAMP authorization as a CSP or a cloud service provider, you're, you're listed on like a, on a broader marketplace, right? With, with other cloud partners and, and technology providers. So when you're listed on that marketplace, federal agencies and other providers and in, in general and the general public really can view and potentially decide to leverage your offerings, right? There's this notion of reuse. That's, that's the, big, the, the, the big advantage of, of FedRAMP. Uh, another advantage is, again, FedRAMP uses NIST as kind of the under, uh, underbelly, right? The policies and procedures are the backbone of FedRAMP. And, and so the ability to meet 
FedRAMP inherently means that you're able to meet NIST and that boosts credibility, not only with the public sector, but also within the private sector. And I think I've seen this more with some of our customers that just general SaaS businesses have looked at FedRAMP as sort of a gold standard for controls that they need to go through, which is kind of a good way into my segue is like, can you describe the relationship between FedRAMP and the underlying standards from NIST, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you kind of an idea of how they relate and how they map, right? So many, but not all, of, of the FedRAMP requirements kind of tie back to an underlying NIST standard publication or an SP, right? So the most obvious is, is NIST RMF, the Risk Management Framework. So that would be 853. Uh, right now we're on REF5. So, so that is a catalog of, of security and privacy controls. Uh, the FedRAMP baselines then are essentially a tailored selection of those NIST 853 controls with an additional layer on top of FedRAMP parameters and guidance. And then, so right now, actually, we're in the midst of new um, draft baseline uh, on REF5 for FedRAMP. So FedRAMP is actually in the process of inviting public comment to review those underlying standards. And then you also have supplemental guidance and discussion that's contained within FedRAMP baselines that might point to other NIST publications specific, you know, specific to things like incident handling or TLS, digital identity and, and DNSSEC and, and a lot more. So they're very intertwined. And then lastly, I would say there's FedRAMP also produces guides, right, that might be very specific to how they want to enforce you know, the performance management criteria and the escalatory paths. So that's another kind of document repository that FedRAMP maintains. So when someone is going through the certification process, can you describe some of the common barriers that you've seen? And it's an interesting question because the certification piece is actually only half the battle. On the front end, you deal with the readiness, right? And then on the back end, you deal with what FedRAMP would call continuous monitoring. And then challenges can pop up at many points along that journey. So just to start out, if the business case is not compelling enough to become FedRAMP authorized, you might have trouble actually getting prioritized to begin with. And that, that prioritization is going to happen between you and your, you know, your leadership team at your company, but also yeah. with FedRAMP, right? They need to understand and they need to be able to vouch that this is a good you know, cloud service provider to take on. And then after prioritization, another barrier that might come up is you know, just getting getting through the readiness stage. And the readiness, uh, FedRAMP calls it the readiness assessment or the RAR you might hear. This requires CSPs prove a pretty comprehensive set of federal mandates. And, and then it, with, where they don't, where they can't meet those mandates, they need to at least show that there's, you know, the ability to remediate them in a reasonable time. And then after that, they need to go through an, an assessment, pro, full-blown assessment process and put together a security package and of course, after authorization, they need to maintain that authorization and make sure performance management, right, operation of visibility, patching, and things like that. So at any of these points, if, if the joint authorization board that's responsible for that CSP notices that there is any deficient controls, a lack of visibility, or something like that, 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 could, re that could lead to you know, escalatory actions that, that, are, that are taken up by FedRAMP. So there's a, there's a real investment and in critical attention that needs to be paid to ensure that, you know, that decision to get FedRAMP authorized was, is a good decision that you can sustain. It's the difference between like, I guess, SOC 1 and SOC 2, where in which SOC 2 has to be continuous upkeeping of it and go through an external auditor, whereas SOC 1, I believe, is self-assessed. Yeah. So for example, a, a type one might just be focused on design, right? And whereas a type two SOC report will be focused on the design and the operating expense effectiveness of controls. Uh, again, a SOC one might be a more on the uh, internal controls over financial reporting. And then you have type one, type two. For a SOC two, you have more of a focus on security and trust criteria. Whether it's SOC or PCI, high trust or FedRAMP, all these compliance frameworks not just a one-time lift because these customers need renewed assurance. Typically, in the case of SOC, it's, for cloud service providers, it's usually semi-annually or whatever cadence they agree on. In the case of FedRAMP, once you are authorized, it's an annual reassessment. As far as your company is concerned, you have to always be 
making sure that you're meeting controls, keeping up to date with all of the updates coming um, as they sort of change as well? Yeah, there's multiple teams that need to be spun up, right, to support this, whether it's taking service all the way through authorization, whether it's just documenting the system security plans, whether it's it's getting kind of into the into the, into the trenches with engineering teams and the FedRAMP to explain how architecture, uh, to explain high-level high architectures and data flows. There's typically multiple teams that get that get created to be able to support a FedRAMP authorization. Not it's not a one person or two person yeah, yeah. show usually. So one thing I was introduced to FedRAMP is that we have a FedRAMP version of our product, which helps obtain certain NIST requirements. So we had people saying like, we need to obtain AC10 concurrent session control. Yeah. A couple of years ago, we made this like table list out all the NIST requirements. This is what the features we've done to help obtain that control. And I know the FedRAMP is kind of huge. This is only like a small part of it, but while going through your certification, what's your thoughts on like how much you can sort of build in-house fees sort of buy externally to help you on that journey? It's a very loaded topic, so I'll try to offer like my limited perspective on, and then you know give you a couple examples. So I think the decision to uh, build versus buy, you know, first depends on the nature and breadth of the service offering, the cloud delivery model that they want to pursue, whether it's IaaS, PaaS, or SaaS, and then overall kind of like the business strategy. So for for simplicity, if a service provider wants to focus on a very specialized niche product, they might be inclined to outsource a great deal of the IT operations and correlating controls. So it might make a lot of sense to buy third-party capabilities, which from a FedRAM sense would be considered augmentative to the boundary, especially if those third parties third parties are FedRAM authorized or compliant, that, that can be a nice kind of like point two exercise where you can help meet the spirit of controls. But you know, not only can companies that do that tap into the expertise of those providers, but again, they can certainly inherit certain controls. That type of relationship doesn't always automatically preclude the primary provider from needing a FedRAMP authorization. There might still be pressure from customers and from the regulator themselves that the primary provider um, you know, gets FedRAMP authorized. But it's again, a lot of it comes down to negotiation and risk this discussions with FedRAMP sometimes and, and the assessors. To sort of summarize, like, I think in the world of just supporting technology, you can't really do everything unless you're a huge company. So probably at some point you'll need to either buy some infrastructure or something else. But I think the shared responsibility model from Absolutely. AWS is kind of a good yeah. example in which you, they're responsible for a certain part, but you're still responsible for a lot of sort of above it. And that's kind of like where examples of keeping in your controls is a good example. Absolutely. Um, and I think another interesting technical difference for our FedRAMP version is that we compile with Boring Crypto, which is a Google project that offers FIPS 142 compliant cryptography, which Google, I guess, went through the process to get that cryptographic library certified by the government. And that's the reason why we use it, because it's sort of a yeah. blessed cryptographic library, which I thought was kind of pretty interesting process to go through. Can you describe the difference between something being FIPS validated and FIPS compliant? I'm here smiling because it's my favorite topic. And so, so FIPS validation is the process of actually taking, a, a, like you said, an algorithm or a module all the way through a validation program using an independent lab. So it would be either taking it through CAVP or CMVP. Um, that process is a heavy lift can take many, many months to complete it. And there's also been well-documented uh, you know, operational bottlenecks and automation challenges that NIST and the government uh, acknowledges. So that's the gold standard, right? To get FIPS validated is the end game yep. goal, if it makes sense from a business perspective. Another commonly used term, FIPS compliant. See, the only, the only problem is that term of FIPS compliant creates a lot of confusion and, 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 and often gets conflated. From my experience, it's really not a recognized designation, despite it actually holding some, some meaning, right? FIPS compliant is really a claim. So like a company might say they're FIPS compliant, but it's nothing more than a claim to say that a system, their system meets requirements outlined in various FIPS publications. I think the more appropriate term is FIPS approved, NIST recommended, or NSA approved. Those are actually designations that actually bear some weight because they suggest that, you know, a technology or an algorithm or module, you know, uses specific ciphers and modes of operation 
that NIST recognizes or, yeah. or that NIST considers secure. You know, those nuances have been a pretty common topic among CSPs, third-party assessors, and the, and, the, and the government, obviously. I like to think in, about this, this topic in terms of SIPs validated versus SIPs approved or NIST recommended as opposed to using the SIPs compliance. Yeah, it's a good kind of like description. And I think often when we have people coming, we, it's part of that sort of journey. And we say, you know, you're also going through these controls. But I think one thing you talked about before we joined and started was there's also the human aspect of you often have to explain this to people who are reviewing these controls and technologies can be different. And so if you can point someone to, oh, we're using this technology, this is how this thing solves it, it can make that sort of introduction to the problem easier. And I don't know if you could just like summarize yeah. um, sort of that education process of going through sort of an audit. One thing that's helped me kind of in risk discussions or negotiations with assessors and, and, and the government has been the ability to invoke um, certain you know, this, like NIST discussions or supplemental guidance, right? Because that's where the science and the technology meets. Um, and being able to tie the risk to those things is a great tool for, the, for you to use with assessors and, and the government. Another thing is just actually trying to, uh, and that's why I say using things like SIPs approved or NIST recommended, those are actually terms that are cited in glossaries within standard publications, right? And in various publications. Whereas again, a SIPs compliant is just a, a claim. Another another tactic that really helps is just being very, um, I think, transparent and help and, and working hard to help the you know the reviewers, the JAB reviewers understand your authorization boundary. Like you know it, whether it's giving them free tutorials or training to understand how they can log into a, a console or initiate a command using programmatic access through an API, helping them, or even taking them through a data center, like for a, for a tour, helping them understand, you know, how, how certain services work or even atypical services might work is a good way to earn trust with them as you, you maintain it's what, what's usually a long-term relationship. Right? Really makes sense. So FedRAMP was started to make it possible to offer a standardized approach to security authorization for let's say cloud service uh, offerings, but some companies might also encounter FISMA, which is the Federal Information Security Modernization Act. Can you explain what type of company might encounter um, this act when selling to the government? Yeah, so, so both FISMA and, and FedRAMP, they, they leverage very similar standards. The only different, the differentiating factor between them is how they originate, who they target, and then how they select the controls. Companies that might not be cloud oriented or that might have a more direct relationship with a single agency might be more inclined towards using a FISMA assessment. It, you know, FISMA is the law, it, it's enforceable through some OMB memos and it, it uses NIST guidance, whereas FedRAMP is it's a more uh, risk management fr uh, program that comes out of, uh, you know, a policy that was issued in 2011, which is the cloud first policy. So while the categorization process of controls between these two are very similar. A FedRAMP assessment actually needs to be performed by a third-party assessment organization, whereas a FISMA assessment can be actually performed directly by an agency. So again, if, if a company has more of a direct relationship with an agency and they might not have as much cloud-oriented technologies, they might be more inclined towards a FISMA. Uh, another significant difference, I think, between the two is that FISMA is kind of like a one-to-one -one authorization process versus a one-to-many in, in FedRAMP. So a successful FISMA assessment might grant an, H, an authority to operate for one organization, whereas a CSP that is assessed, you know, through, through FedRAMP can be, you know, that authorization can be reused across, across the government. So I've seen it described before that like essentially FedRAMP is kind of FISMA for, for the cloud. And I think that's a really simplistic way to, to think about it. It also sounds like if you, if you have a generic tool, which solves a problem to lots of different government branches, you're probably better to go FedRAMP because once you have it, you can easily sell between parks and recs and the NSA if they have the same problem. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, the, and the funny thing is with a FedRAMP authorization, you don't even need to pursue a FedRAMP authorization to achieve that reciprocity or that reuse. Even if you 
achieve an agency, agency authorization for FedRAMP, other agencies can, can go through their own risk-based decision to leverage that offering. Reuse is actually possible in both authorization paths, whether it's a job authorization or whether it's an agency authorization. And that's obviously, you know, sometimes forgotten, I think. Okay, that's good to know. So let's say a startup has closed their first large government contract and they might find that the moderate FedRAMP isn't enough. So they start to look in at a sort of cloud service provider, which is specifically designed for running government workloads. I think one of the most common examples would be the AWS Gov Cloud. I think actually one of the most interesting things while reading the marketing page was that it jumped out to me that customers needed to have only a US personal green card holder can have access to the root keys. What other controls make uh, involved with these sort of government cloud providers? Yeah, I'll give a little context into that requirement too, and then talk a little bit about the, you know, the other human driven control. So kind of the premise behind a, a gov cloud region or a high impact region like that is that customers have, you know, specific regulatory or compliance requirements. It might be an ITAR requirement. It might be a DOD SRG or a FedRAMP high. At the end of the day, they want to receive kind of a higher level of guarantee and assurance not necessarily a higher level of security because security should be very, very strong even at the moderate, uh, moderate levels. So there are certain logical and physical security controls, like you said, around credentialing, for example, or the management of root, uh, root keys, data center and region designs, and of course, other requirements such as the U.S. person's rule. Uh, and then finally, an actually more expansive control set and control enhancements. Uh, as far as like, you know, these resources being restricted to U.S. persons, a lot of that comes down to the screening and vetting requirements as well as contractual customer agreements. So what I mean by that is as cloud service providers want to preserve a U.S. person's only environment for customers, uh, you know, they're providing certain guarantees on their end around protecting those sensitive mm-hmm. workloads. So it could be totally compromised if there isn't a similar expectation for the users authenticating through special accounts. So that's kind of where you can't just invoke and say share responsibility, we will hype our hands clean. It's not necessarily the traditional shared responsibility model, for example, that AWS would say applied to a GovCloud account. It, there's, there's more contractual uh, agreements and expectations because it's a whole different uh, logon page, right? For example, to get to a, to get to a GovCloud or a high impact region. And then in terms of other human controls, Beyond the persons, you know, the U.S. persons requirement, the resident, there's a residency requirement as well. So typically these regions will, will have, you know, support engineers and operators that deal with protected resources. Those such p- persons will need to reside in the U.S., right, and be U.S. persons. Now, if they're dealing with more basis, basic use cases and customer calls and might not be directly involved in the protection of resources, Though, you know, you, you might not have to, to live or, or reside in the United States. It really depends on a, on a per use case. But I think if you had, let's say, like a database with other sensitive government information in it, the only person who could access that has to reside in the U.S. and be a, either U.S. resident or green card holder. Correct. Yeah, for critical, for critical actions like that or to protect resources or, or you know, even if, you know, just as... Um, a member of a support engineer, right? You might have to help with escalation sometimes, and you might need to, again, you know, access those resources. So those people would need to be U.S. persons uh, and reside in the U.S. Yeah, so you could have like a t- ticket desk, which could have frontline maybe in Canada, but if you need to actually touch the account, you need to be in the U.S., sort of hand off the ticket. And, and usually those requests, those support, cloud support requests will kind of get triaged. So uh, it, as it goes through that first tier, if, you know, whoever's receiving that request deems it to be something that relates to the protection of the resources and something uh, that requires intervention of a workload or a, whatever, a storage DB or something related to the networking, then they'll probably escalate it to those vetted or to those cleared engineers. You know, we talked about moderate FedRAMP and this high FedRAMP. Can you just sort of describe the difference between the two and why you'd want to pursue one over the other? The difference, as, as I was mentioning, the high impact zone gives you a little bit more of an expansive set of control enhancements for NIST 863. It also introduces certain logical and physical differences. So the physical is obviously the data centers will be restricted. 
the logical access re related to credentialing and who can access it. And I would again, I would not say that high impact gives you more security. It just provides you more guarantees that you can meet certain underlying requirements such as ITAR, such as DOD, and such as FedRAMP, such as FedRAMP High. I know we talked about shared responsibility, but if you picked GovCloud, does that mean that you have more security compliance handled by AWS, or is it just the same as running your standard workload in an AWS region? Not necessarily. I think shared responsibility, which is not only exclusive to an AWS, it applies to other cloud service providers, that kind of transcends the impact regions, right? Because it's very fundamental to how the cloud works. The cloud provider will, will be responsible for certain things and the customer will be responsible for certain things. The, you know, the cloud service provider will be responsible for the physical infrastructure, right? And the hardware that comes with it. They need to make sure that data centers are up and running, the availability zones and ed edge sites are up and running and resilient. And then, you know, they're responsible for providing a software that, that's there, be it compute storage and, and DV or networking. And the cloud service provider needs to make sure that all of those things are secure. Customer, on the other hand, comes in um, after selecting a cloud offering. They're responsible for their data, right? They're responsible for their data, how they manage access to that data, how they configure their systems, and then how they implement protections such as encryption. And I think my favorite one is like the same with credentials. So to get into a data center, you might have to go through biometrics and yeah. verify different inf um, information. You should do the same for whatever API keys you get or logins for your cloud service provider as well. Depending on the high impact level, I don't think the secure, fundamental security controls change. It might be just a couple tweaks to logical and physical restrictions, but security needs to be just as rigid if for to support a moderate impact or a commercial uh, customer. I think also this year we've seen the current U.S. administration push a few new guidelines for both um, agencies and people supplying software to the government. I think one of the first ones, which was put in November of last year, was creating the Software Bill of Materials or um, SBOM for critical software. Can you talk about how this is affecting the industry from a compliance perspective? It's a great topic. Uh, as you said, the EO kind of introduced a lot of provisions that are, well, it's going to mobilize agencies, it's going to mobilize CSPs and, and other IT companies. So in terms of the SBOM or the Software Bill of Materials, it's, as you know, it's not a, it's not a new concept. There's always been requests of developers, you know, through either through an internal security review or some, or some limited audit to divulge information about you know, where those components were sourced from used in a bill, right? It's, 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 an an SBOM is really just a list of ingredients for a, for a piece of software, yeah. right? Um, and then there's also been an incentive to discover vulnerabilities in malicious code. Uh, and th some, there's been whole industries that have been built around that, that sometimes even the government relies on for their own CISA alerts and bulletins. Uh, but as of 2018, and then now even more so, I think with the EO, the SBOM has been wrapped in a lot of regulation that becomes enforceable. So I think, I think like the criteria packed in the EO kind of it enhances the software supply chain with respect to critical software, but it adds also another layer of complexity and body of work for compliance because now a, a purchaser will need to implement mechanisms to verify that their third parties artifacts and open source libraries are trusted, are, are, are authentic, um, are safe, right? And then they'll need to require yeah. a sponsor for the third party suppliers, track those dependencies, uh, and then kind of start to slowly but surely build and prioritize the right kind of like trusted repositories. Uh, I think before the EO, vulnerability and configuration management was always a kind of a key, a key component of those uh, programs, but now SBOM has kind of uh, added a lot more scrutiny. If we, if we drill a little bit further into kind of compliance and maybe even use FedRAMP as an example, uh, or NIST, around, you know, around the same time SBOM was taking off here in the EO, NIST 853-REV5 introduced a whole new supply chain risk control family. That was very interesting, the timing of that, and there's been controls like SR11, which require CSPs to implement controls around component authenticity. 
and then FedRAMP also ask uh, in, in, in REV5 to ensure that vendors protect the development pipeline. So uh, I think one big topic that's going to impact compliance is this notion of like, how do you independently verify the software components? Vendors can have the best intentions and let you know and give you assurances that their software is secure and built with the right components, but how do you uh, actually verify that that is actually true? And then as a builder of software, finally, I think they will need to secure the build pipelines and protect their artifacts, whether that means using certain build templates or golden paths and images and things like, things to, to make sure, are those are some of the things that companies need to focus on now that SBOM is wrapped in, in regulation. It's a huge topic. And I think especially when you look at how like all software is built on other software. So even if you think a dependency is a small dependency, that dependency you could have a Absolutely. big graph of ripple. other dependencies, which are included sometime at build time. Absolutely. There, there will be ripple effects and then the dependencies will develop as, as there are new patches and upgrades and those and those software packages, uh, you know, are, are advanced. Yeah. So is there, you're saying in version five of the FedRAMP guidelines, there's more explicit guidelines for this? So yeah, in, 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 in this um, 853 revision, revision five, which was published in, in late 2020, there was a new control family denoted with SR. So that SR control family was introduced in REF5. And of course, FedRAMP, as they do a tailored selection, they also have pulled that control family into their, their baselines. And I think the thing that is interesting about FedRAMP is this is all great advice that every software company should be striving for, which is sort of interesting that sometimes government regulation doesn't always make that much sense. Yeah. But I'd say lots, if you read it, like lots of FedRAMP actually makes a lot of sense um, and it's something to sort of aim for. Absolutely. And that's why, you know, when you mentioned how do you ensure cloud service practitioner that you're successful with, with the government or with assessors, it, I, think, I think it's huge to be able to kind of invoke the underlying NIST requirements because that's, that's enforceable, right? It, it's, it's very rare that, you know, you invoke something like that or you reference like something like that and it's not acknowledged by FedRAMP because the FedRAMP program was built around around this i think another one i think that came out at the beginning of this year is a um, moved for zero trust architecture which is similar to soda flare and the recent logboard j vulnerabilities can you see this changing the roadmaps for federal security and compliance i, th I think it can that's a, zero trust has always been kind of a, a big buzz buzzword and again not not entirely a new concept but it was re-emphasized in the eo so it's, it's going to be like a deliberate approach by the government to adopt across the board a bigger focus on identity and, 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 and access control, ultimately to manage cyber incidents as well, right? Um, it was actually introduced, you know, almost a decade ago, uh, but it kind of returned to the spotlight because early adopters such as Google and Adobe really kind of mastering the concept. And then it, it got more popularity recently with, with the cyber incidents and, and, and things like that. So it's, it's emerged even further. The interesting thing about zero trust is like most security practitioners will agree that most data breaches have a connection to compromised privilege credentials. So while the focus on like perimeter security, you know, your endpoints, firewalls, your network protections is essential. Zero trust kind of, you know, it revolves around again, identity and credential based threats. So, you know, how will that impact the roadmap for, for security and compliance, I think it's going to cause agencies and cloud service providers to place more emphasis on, the, on programs that support identity and authentication. Practitioners can assume a better baseline around access controls, continuous auditing, and those type of things. And another thing with zero trust is because the word, the name itself kind of creates a, sometimes even a negative perception, like, you know, are we talking about you know, bad employees and bad actors and all these kind of bad user experiences that are associated with zero trust. It's more about creating a culture around granting rights based, uh, based on confidence, the right confidence levels. And that's what zero trust is, is, is really about. Yeah. And I think it's also splitting how people view like the authentication for your authorization. So proving that the person is the person 
they say they are, then also saying that that person can perform these actions at this time. Absolutely. It's, right, it's, it's like you said, it's right about uh, implementing the right implement uh, mechanisms to establish authentication and, and give people, and not, it's not just as simple as saying, you know, least privilege or need to know there's it's deeper than, than that. I think that, and that's why I mentioned things like adaptive security controls and continuous auditing. You don't just grant access once and forget about it. You're going to have to monitor those accounts and make sure that they're trustworthy. Yeah. That's great. Um, so as we wrap it up, one thing that we've not covered already is your background um, in accounting. And in my experience, most auditors come from an accounting background, you know, completing a SOC 2, for example, they'd be technically the same person who could complete your taxes. Can you talk yeah. about your certification as a certified information systems auditor? Yeah, so sure. So I probably won't be doing your taxes. I'll probably direct you towards tax counselor or CPA. But I, I think your observation is is spot on in terms of, you know, a person that's in IT audit might have it's 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 on, it's common that a person in IT audit has background in accounting, and that's mostly because of the emphasis on integrated audits, the relevance of IT systems to financial statement processes, and then a lot of shared kind of audit methodologies, right? So obtaining my, my CISA certification was something that just made a lot of sense when I was entrenched in information technology audits. It's, it's certainly a preferred certification with the employers and I think gives you a lot of baseline knowledge. But as, as with anything in certifications, it's only going to be as good as your application of it and how you augment that with practical experience. What was your sort of transition between sort of the accounting to the tech field and what are some unique challenges that you've encountered? as I moved away from pure audit related roles and then more into security, security insurance and cloud-based technologies, it was sort of a natural realization for me that I needed to uplift my skills through self-study and, and of course, practical experience. So I've been very intentional about, you know, um, attaining experience in the cloud service provider industry and software companies. So that means actually applying for certain roles and retaining certain opportunities that came my way but also just obtaining a few you know, certifications in cloud architecture to understand the principles of cloud technology that, that make those companies successful. So it's a combination, I think, of pivoting into those industries versus you know, the industries I was in before I joined cloud service, and then also taking some certifications in, in cloud architecture. One last question. So we mostly have a developer or security focused audience and I'm sure having a meeting with a security compliant manager wouldn't, as I say, inspire joy for many devs. What are some of your tips for working successfully together? So I'll give a few examples and some tips that have worked for me and that I've, I've also gotten feedback from engineers um, on. So, you know, a few practical examples where I've kind of in, engaged engineers and developers like in a compliance function was I've, I've worked with engineers to you know, present penetration test findings on their services and then kind of digging deep into the risk, the understanding the impact, you know, whether there's operational requirements or false positives, and then coming down, uh, concluding on a proper remediation. We've also worked with security operation teams to triage, analyze, and effectively communicate cyber incidents. Um, compliance and assurance folks tend to also write recommendation papers to networking, security, and infrastructure operation teams to spark the development of features or the launch of campaigns. When I think of all these, you know, mm -hmm. just these few examples and some of my interactions, uh, I think of three things top of mind uh, to ensure a successful collaboration. One is the ability to appropriately articulate the customer impact to these engineering teams. That's one thing I think we can all unite on if we get it right. If we can explain why this matters to the customer, why something needs to be done, then I think the engineers will be more inclined to support what, what you want to do. Two, the ability to actually minimize the burden of interpretation on, on that, right? So what I mean by that is the last thing an engineer wants or a developer is for you to like send them a link to some standard or to tell, like drop a long list of requirements and sub-requirements that will literally bore them to death, right? You have to distill that and break that down and interpret it for them so it's very low touch. So that's another one. And then, and then three, which is very related to the second point is providing very crisp communications with them and then some mechanisms for tracking that make sense, be it a, you know, for example, a, a, an effective ticketing 
uh, process. Yeah. So th- those three things are just like very simple tips. You know, I would give effectively work with engineers. And then obviously you have to demonstrate certain knowledge of their of their service, right? Like if you're going in talking about a, a specific service or a feature, you got to do your homework and understand that. And then you also have to demonstrate to them that that you're a subject matter expert in in your field. And I think for when, with all those things as they come together, the you know engineering and developers will be more compelled to work with you as as a partner, not because they they have to. Perfect. I think that's a great way to um, finish the podcast. Thank you so much for your time today, and it was awesome. Thank you so much. This podcast is brought to you by Teleport. Teleport is the easiest, most secure way to access all your infrastructure. The open source Teleport access plane consolidates connectivity, authentication, authorization, and auditing into a single platform. By consolidating all aspects of infrastructure access, Teleport reduces attack surface area, cuts operational overhead, easily enforces compliance, and improves engineering productivity. Learn more at goteleport.com or find us on GitHub, github.com slash gravitational forward slash teleport.